uh, dear Earthmates, we are visiting Patrick Chan. Is this the correct pronunciation of your name? Absolutely correct, yes. Wonderful. And this is our first meeting, almost, nearly. Uh, and uh, you live in Vancouver, Canada, right? Vancouver, Canada. That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful city. I've been there. And you, you were just saying something about World War II. Yes, please. There was this uh, little-known battle uh, in the in the 1940s when the Nazi invaded uh, France. Uh, they they tried to go through Belgium, and then they also went through the Ardennes forest as as something that was unexpected, and so on. And they basically got the uh, British expedition and the French army on the run. And so they were they were going up to uh, Dunkirk. And uh, so you, you're talking about 200, 300,000 uh, soldiers being trapped over there. And the Nazis, uh, Panzer, uh, the tanks, were on the heels. One small group of soldiers from the Allied army resisted in one of the towns. And they only have about 80 tanks versus something like uh, a few hundreds, the, the Nazis. So it, it's, it, it's a... It's a no hope situation. But what happened was because of these 80 tanks, these 80 brave tank men, the Nazis high command in Belgium, in, in Berlin, had second thoughts about uh, progressing too fast. So they actually gave time for the 200 or so soldiers to escape back to England to fight another day. So that little battle, you can say, changed the course of history. If if the if the Nazi captured the 200, 300,000 uh, war-hardened, experienced soldiers, the ally, it would be very much harder to build up again in England uh, over the years. So so it's all about timing. So so this little army did a lot of uh, changes to world history. And 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 you may say, well, you know, the, the British government, uh, Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of England at that point, if they lost this 200, 300,000 soldiers, they may be forced to have some kind of a peace treaty with Hitler, uh, Nazi Germany. And so that would change the course of history. Without England, uh, Hitler would only have one front fighting the Soviet Union on, on the eastern side. They would never have... Uh, Normandy in 1944, you know, D-Day landing landing on uh, Normandy with uh, the movie uh, Saving Private Ryan, for example. That would never have happened. Uh, North Africa would have been lost in, in all that sense. So just a little battle could change something. So you were talking about, well, you know, we are all individuals and we are weak compared to the evil of uh, ammunition factories and so on. Yeah, yeah, but... But we just don't know uh, what little part of what we're doing is going to change history because of our effort in that regard. So, so I always teach my my young daughters. I said, you know, don't don't look at little things that you think are insignificant. Uh, it's the butterfly effect. So we just yes. don't know which butterfly, which <laughs> butterfly is going to make the difference. So <laughs> true, true, Patrick, true, and um, and. Uh, uh, we, as uh, as Earthmates, uh, as uh, Earth Civilization Network, we are a small group in number. We are uh, uh, we have a good synergy, and we want to be able to produce an example that can be uh, learned from, so that certain ideas can travel. Uh, not only COVID nineteen can travel fast, but good ideas can also travel fast today so that's the thing and uh, meeting you uh, is is wonderful uh, you have wonderful energy and very fruitful uh, will you please uh, mention a few things about your about your life first of all uh, okay you are an engineer and an entrepreneur uh, okay uh, shall we start with that i mean mm. Many years ago, um, I'll tell you another personal story. 
I, 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 um, I lived intentionally moved to China for four years just to learn the language and the culture. Mm. Uh, even though I may look the part, I'm uh, the furthest thing. I'm, you know, a product of the Western world, uh, educated in the West and, and uh, went to university here in North America and so on. Um, so I went there and, and learned about things. Um, and as an engineer, I, I look at the world, you know, with numbers and thermodynamics and calculus and so on. Um, but uh, since we, we sold the company um, a number of years ago, uh, there are people who want us to provide them with uh, soft skill trainings, uh, the, learning about yeah, those. Sorry, the company, sorry. what was the company that you sold? Uh, that was a company that built educational software. It's called Greenwood Canada. And uh, we sold part of that. And um, that, was, uh, that was that uh, was more than a decade ago. And then um, they, uh, the same customers, uh, basically, they, they said, well, Patrick, why don't, why don't you provide us with uh, why the world, why the world loves the Western entrepreneurial spirit? What is it since you're from the West? And um, I work in uh, California for many years, so so I know the culture a little bit, and and so uh, that promised to build a nonprofit into creating something called the World Civility Index. So so this index is somewhat similar to a person's uh, personal credit rating, but instead of measuring how well you can pay your bills, for example, it measure uh, how much manners you have, how much empathy you have um, your, your, your past exposure to something like this. So this World Civility Index is this kind of measurement um, so that, for example, in the commercial world, companies can use that as a hiring criteria. So for the job seekers coming in, if they had, can show, you know, one person have 300 points, let's say, and the other person don't even know about the World Civility Index, well, uh, we recommend that the company to to give the interview to the person with the 300 points because that person already has gone through a lot of the education in empathy, in etiquette, and so on. So, so that is the kind of motivation that we had uh, about 12 years ago. That's how, that's when we started the uh, World Civility Index. It's a grassroots movement, so it's, it's, it's uh, created by a, a bunch of uh, very experienced uh, soft skill trainers and, uh, and a group of engineers like myself. So I, I'm, I was uh, coordinating that, created that group, and now we're in uh, 19 countries. So, right. so that is what we have been doing. Congratulations and thank you. Uh... Uh, this the notion of civility. Will you please explain it a little bit? Civility. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's much more than um, social etiquette or dining etiquette, like which fork to use at the dining table. Mm. Um, a lot of the trainers do that, but the spirit is really about cultivating young people. For example, in learning about respect. Um, a lot of young people, if, especially if I go to um, university and so on and talk about civility and so on to engineering students, I almost always got laughed out of the room. And I can see myself being that young person or young group myself 30 years ago um, because I didn't know any better. I always thought that, you know, a good product will sell itself. Yes and no. Most of the time, you don't sell the product unless there's good communication and respect for the audience and respect for the social expectations and so on. So those are the kind of things that I've changed over the last 30 years uh, since I graduated. And uh, the personal story comes like this. I was at a, at a train station in China. And we were doing some <clears throat> marketing and so on. And uh, my uh, my uh, CFO, my chief financial officer was with me and so on. And, and he is from that area. And so he said, oh, sorry, you know, I didn't realize today, you know, we had meetings. But this is actually the Chinese New Year's Eve. 
And there at the at the Sunjin uh, train station, there were something like 20,000 people there. A station that was designed maybe for 5,000, but they got 20,000. So it was just jam packed. Everybody was just walking like this, like penguins. And he said, oh, Patrick, I'm sorry. You know, I know you're from, uh, from the West and you're not used to being crowded like this. And I said something that surprised me. I said, wow, these are all the people going back home to visit their families, right? That's the Chinese tradition for, for them to go back to wherever village they come from. They're working in Zhenzhen, you know, working Foxconn, building iPhones and so on. And I, and I said, wow, 20,000 love stories. And thinking back, I said, if it was a Patrick Chan 30 years ago, I would never have said that. I would have said, oh my God, this is such horrible situation. We can't get anything done. It's, you know, the train is, uh, is jam-packed and we probably won't be able to get a seat on there and so on. But I think I've changed since, since we built this nonprofit called the World Supplied Index in that I myself is also learning as to what is empathy, is to be able to see from their side. I mean, you, you see you see Chinese, you know, some of the laborers and so on, uh, they take the train, same train station, you know, they're carrying a lot of stuff, you know, in their bags and, and backpacks and so on, uh, food and whatever, carrying back to the village. So you see that they are bringing something back to their, to their hometown, uh, small, uh, impoverished, most likely, so, you know, those are kind of things that uh, I was very happy. So I, you know, I always uh, write my journal and tell my daughters about, you know, my experience and so on. So I think those are the kind of things that um, when we do something like that, we also grow in the sense that I, I saw things that I didn't see 30 years ago until I was at that train station. So I think that was something that, um, that I gained. But my wife, Fusun, and I, we visited uh, China uh, about uh, nine years ago. Uh, we went to Beijing and Shanghai and a few other places. And we were impressed, of course, very much. And uh, um, I'd love to spend some time in China, maybe at a university, especially uh, where they teach uh, Turkology or you know, uh, Turkish language and literature. Uh, and I would like to learn a lot, actually. Maybe it will be possible someday. Um, and uh, I owe a lot to Lao Tse, Confucius. Uh, of course, they are among my masters uh, in human history. Um, civility is actually maybe... Uh, a, a, a good word for living virtuously in a way uh, and um, uh, yes it, it needs constant awareness actually because I guess in all of us uh, there is a good tendency and a destructive tendency and nobody can be sure if you know we we should always be well disciplined from inside uh, with a good intention, not oppressive, but uh, and uh, thanks to nature, thank nature, uh, we have the potential, we have the capacity actually. Um, your childhood. What what do you think about your childhood when you look back? Well, um, my, my parents uh, escaped communist China mm. when I was three years old. Mm. And uh, I was born in Shanghai, China. And uh, even to this day, I have been labeled as a communist. And uh, But the kind of things is, um, I, I don't blame people saying something like this in, in, in the press. In fact, just, uh, just today, I, I received something like this. And people ask me if I'm upset. I I I have passed that stage. I I I have a I'm quite thick skinned now because people just don't know, right? People who discriminate are people usually who don't know. Um, are they really bad people? 
I may have to confess, like my wife was saying, you know, you are discriminating too, Patrick, in a bad way. And and I and I have to do self reflection. And I said, yeah, you know, sometimes I discriminate without even thinking about it, right? So that's 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 part of the game. And, and, and I have a lot of um, friends here in Canada who who are not not ethnic Chinese or anything like that, and 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 they have different perspective that I that I learn from. So I think I think the the, the good thing about growing up in a place like Canada. Where where there are different multi ethnic groups, not just Caucasian, the, the 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 British or the French and and so on, but they are also from the Middle East, in Turkey, uh, from different places. It's a very rich environment where we become a little bit more empathetic because we have personal experience. Uh, having friends who are oh yeah you know I got a friend from Turkey. I got another friend from Iran and and people from Nigeria. You know, they they are they are not mi Middle Easterners. They are not Central Asians. They are not Blacks. They are just John, uh, mm. Eric, and uh, Kevin. You know, they 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 are they are friends. It's only oh oh yeah, you are Black. You are Middle Easterner, and and so on. You know, it's it's only. <laughs> It becomes a totally reverse kind of view of of looking at the world, and and I think when we are able to do something like that, we 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 gain a lot. We become a hopefully a little bit more neutral in that we we are not as skewed in our view. And oh yeah, you know somebody from China must be communist. Well, you know some people actually want to escape the country, and 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 the sad thing is you are labeling them for exactly the thing that they want to escape. So, you know, those are kind of things that are unfair. And I think if you talk about uh, equality or equity, that is the thing that we got to be aware of that, you know, not all Russians want to go into war, I'm sure. And and so by labeling all Russians are uh, aggressors, uh, we are doing more disservice to, to the world than trying to uh, wipe out this kind of, uh, wipe out the war. For whoever is right or wrong, it's, it's immaterial. True. And also words, uh, adjectives, categories have different meanings for different people. Uh, for example, if you consider that the word communist is related to the word uh, commune, uh, then Jesus Christ was a pro-commune <laughs> person. He was, a, he was a communist in that sense. He was a communist. <laughs> so... Uh, so uh, uh, but unfortunately, um, it's sad that certain words have lost credibility for the most, most part. Well, that's uh, another issue, yes. Um, so you mentioned your daughters. I have one daughter and two grandchildren. And you you have uh, two daughters, three? You I have two. One is uh, 22 and the other one is uh, 18. Uh, the oldest one is just finishing her kinesiology um, at UBC, University of British Columbia, here in oh, Vancouver. And the other one is in uh, computer science, also uh, at the UBC. Wonderful. So, yeah. Let me ask you this. Um, a father with a daughter, one or two, um, uh, when your daughter reached your first daughter reached the age of 18 did you have a crisis i did i mean sh she's a panic you know she's becoming a woman and i'm losing her or although you know some you know what what should my new limitations be as what are my duties and rights as a father etc did you have a few problems with that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can. I. 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 Uh, I can empathize with what you're doing. It's. It's like when when they were younger, especially my older one. He. She was very curious. Uh, she would, you know, go to the computer and say, "Hey, daddy, daddy, what are you writing in your journal today?" You know, she would want to check out my journal and and so on. Um. That that was when she was, you know, much younger, and then came. Uh, yeah, 18 or so. 
she changed into a different person to me anyway. Uh -huh. She she was much cooler. She was much jaded. You know, anything in the world is almost like she has seen it and done it all. And and she has her own mind. And and I I I seem to not be able to tap into that. Um, but friends have been telling me, you know, that that is something that is normal. Um, and they will come back after about 25 or so. They were going to come back and say, oh, daddy is, is my good old dad and so on. So, yeah. so I'm, I'm counting my years, my days <laughs> that they would go to when they hit 25 or something like that. And, and that they will come back and, and because, give me a hug. Yes, I, I, I think a father may be the only man in a uh, girl's life that she can be sure usually uh, that uh, never upset her that will never upset her this is important we need some uh, strongholds in life uh, psychologically that may be one person two people three people um, uh, so uh, and how did you change when you became a father it changed me totally. I think I think the the you know the train station incident that I talked about earlier was uh, in fact uh, a product of having my daughters. You know, I I, I watched them in the uh, delivery room coming out into this world. Uh, it changed me completely as a, as a person. You know, I I wasn't thinking like that. I was thinking about myself and, and all that career, uh, business, um, all that. But after that, it's not the focus on me. Uh, you know, my wife and I, you know, it, for her, obviously. But for me, um, the focus was on them. What can I do so that they can live in a world that would be a little more comfortable uh, compared to now? So whatever I can do is no longer about me uh, business and so on, or my survival, uh, I always keep on telling them we're going to be gone and they need to take care of each other. And and we always tell the oldest girl that the younger one is a gift for her. Um, I, I wanted just one kid, but my wife said, you know, Patrick, if we're not going to have a second one, we, we're we going to have big issues. I go, oh, okay. So we have a second one. And I I've been so happy that you know uh, with her wisdom having a second one uh i i just i just think it was a wonderful thing um in yeah. fact in fact i joke i joke about oh hey why don't we have a third one i love the two two girls why don't we have a third one and she said i am done if you want a third one you have to find another woman to have a third one <laughs> so <laughs> yeah that that would mean extra business uh, uh... In, in in my case, I, I said one child, please, and uh, one, yes, but uh, uh, anyway, in China, uh, by the way, one child policy changed uh, recently. Yeah. And uh, uh, by the way, are there intercultural programs between China and other countries. I don't know. Uh, I think all countries should develop uh, exchanges, uh, you know, visiting uh, there. The more we know people, the more peaceful this place can be. Um, we are developing something. Um along the line of intercultural awareness. Hmm. And, and again, as, a, as an entrepreneur uh, running a nonprofit, I always think of how can we provide products and services that people can buy, that we can sell as a nonprofit. So we're becoming a social enterprise. So we don't depend on donations and charities and so on. We never taken any money from that. Uh, so, so now we're talking about setting up some kind of um, upper level management uh, CEO club, if you may, it's between Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines. 
and also in South America too, like Ecuador and, and, and other, other locations where we can have these groups of people learning from each other as to what they see as, 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 uh, as important. Now there are already these groups, so I don't have to start inventing, reinventing the wheel. What we're saying is we can put the World Civilian Index uh, into these activities that are already happening with, with uh, companies setting these up and so on. And all the CEOs and so on can also earn World Civility Index. And by that, they can tap into the program where there are readings and, and, and uh, occasional webinars and so on. All that program that are not, not created by me, but there are writers, there are reporters from uh, Harvard Business Reviews, uh, professors and, and so on. They would do all that work and we can put that into this uh, container called the World Civility Index Reading Program. And so all of the people, so when the CEOs learn about something like that, they can introduce it to their employees and the employees can also earn World Civility Index and the companies can have an average, an average score. So what happens is it, uh, some, somebody told me, some CEO told me, you know what, Patrick, this is a really good thing because now there's a measurement, there's management. I can actually see, ah, yes, our people are doing so much this year and next year we are doing more or, or whatever. So we can show them what the effort of the employees are. Now, so how does that change the world? Um, when companies want certain things, the workforce usually would comply. If they want people who know computer programming, well, there are a lot of people going to run around and, and learn computer programming. and when the employees, when the workforce comply by extension, the general population will also comply. They will also realize, hey, this is something that is important. And so let's let's learn something like this. That's how email got uh, so popular. In the old days, when I was a youngster, email was uh, the realm of uh, computer scientists and engineers communicating with one another and so on. That was back in the late 1980s. Uh, so how did that, that go about? Now, they introduced email uh, to companies in the United States. And, and so when, when the companies do something like this, then the employees start saying, hey, let's use emails. People resisted. People thought, I can just write my email. I, I can just write my normal mail. I don't need emails and so on. But after they've used it, they realize, hey, this is something really good. So companies, employees start using emails and by extension, general population learn about emails. So that's how things get spread. How they got spread. And so with the World Safety Index, um, we are seeing the same thing now being used by CEOs and upper management and also by employees. And, and the next uh, frontier is to talk to government, local governments and so on and say, why don't you use something like this for your whole citizens? So your whole town can have this World Civility Index measurement. And we can say, because what happens is when company wants to pick location to build their own, to build their next site, factories or whatever, site selection uh, criteria could include the World Civility Index as one of them. So that when they build new sites, they know that people in the town are, are nice, they are uh, empathetic, they are tolerant and so on. So those are the kind of things that we want to move the world to is, is there's some kind of measurement. It's not a lack of training and so on. There are really good trainer out there, training companies and so on, uh, university academia. But the thing is it, it was a lacking of a standard measurement that caused a lot of fragmentation. You know, like, like we said at the very beginning, we are all fragmented. Uh, in our own little world. But now with the universal common measurement platform and there's measurement, uh, cities and towns and countries can do that kind of measurement and spur these kind of culture, if you may. Mm, yes. And by the way, uh, uh, we can now uh, stop before we start another paragraph and go in uh, to go use the same link 
and have more time. I can, I recently learned to combine two parts of a video. Uh, so can go on. Okay, sure. Okay, let's stop here. And then the same link, please. Okay. Okay, sure. In a minute. Thank you. Great. And uh, uh, by the way, uh, what is the um, uh, your website? Uh, the, the 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 Patrick Chan dot. Uh no, the the world civility index uh is being hosted by uh a nonprofit organization called the I I T T I double I double T and an I dot O R G dot org. And oh, um the double I T T I stands double T I, right? Yeah, I I T T I. It stands for International Soft Skills Standards and Testing. Great. And how about your personal site, website? I don't. I don't have a personal website. Um, oh, okay. Everything I do, everything I do, it's going to be with the IITTI. That's my full time job, by the way. This is after we after we sold the company, uh, we made a little bit of money, and um, and uh, uh, I I run the IITTI as a full time. Um, non-salaried uh, position. So I made I made zero dollars in the last 12 years. <laughs> you are a volunteer. I consider myself an Earth Civilization volunteer, for example. And you are also uh, a volunteer. A volunteer, yes. Yes. Um, by the way, there is this uh, discussion about AI and the future of humanity etc uh do you have worries about that um i i i don't have worries i have a lot of um we we have to okay uh, about this iitti um ngo this nonprofit they actually uh, we actually uh publish a youth standard uh about the same time last year in 2022 yeah and uh it's it's all about the youth this is all about AI uh, or, or at addressing the effect of AI. And we are seeing that as tremendous opportunity for young people to really, really live life colorfully because of AI. Because of AI, not in spite of AI, but because of AI, they don't have to do a lot of the boring jobs that a lot of young people, even in Canada, you know, so-called, uh, you know, developed country, quote unquote, a lot of young people are not at the full potential. They work at jobs that they hate, that they go, oh, you know, Patrick, you know, if, if I, if, if I can, you know, if something, 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 I'll do something, something, something. And I go, well, what, what is it? Why? And then we look at, you know, thousands of these cases and we realize we extrapolate it back to a point where what is the root cause of, of these kind of, dissatisfaction, uh, boredom, and yes, mental illnesses. Uh, suicide rate is going through the roof. University counselors in uh, University of British Columbia, for example, my alma mater, they were saying that, oh, Patrick, you know, you don't know, you know, we have to hire, we have to double our staff, counselors, university counselors in, in today's, 2022, 2023, compared to 30 years ago when I, I went to the university, double the size because they said there's such an onslaught of freshmen and uh, students coming in that have mental issues. They don't have a lot of life skills that are taken that you and I may take for granted because we are still the old school. We, we grew up before the internet and so on. A lot of young people, they, you know, they, they are joined to the hip with their, uh, yes, with their cell phone, mm. and and survey was saying that they they much rather uh, uh, have a cell phone than having sex, and 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 so that that that's a big problem. That's why that's why world population is going down in developing world. Well, 
not in developing world, but in in all the society with cell phones. So, so those are big. Now, what what was this youth standard produced by the World Civility Index? There are three main things. One is we need to help young people cultivate hobbies. Watching TikTok or YouTube videos doesn't count. So create, uh, cultivating hobbies. Second thing is we need to teach young people how to talk to old people, talk to people like you and I. Mm. You don't know how to talk to old people now. Third is young people need to learn how to deal with boredom. Oh. They have no concepts of boredom. Everything they can just, just get right there and, and instant gratification. And so we need to have send young people the message that if you want to create anything meaningful in life, you have to walk through the desert of boredom before you get to the other side. And then you can realize those kind of feelings. Like as an engineer myself, as an entrepreneur, you work hard. 90, 99% of your time as a professional life. It's only that 1% you get the glory of, yes, that machine works, that piece of software works, and that product that you're trying to build for the last 10 years is selling like hotcakes. You know, the, the glory is, it's, it's, you know, money and all that is, is a secondary, but it's that feeling, that, that satisfaction, that unless you have gone through that process, you, you can't experience it. So, so those are the kind of things that we need to teach young people. Just because you went to a company and you didn't change the world in three months, that's not the end. That's only the very tip of the iceberg. You need to spend maybe the next 30 years into building something that is really, really, really useful to you. So, you know, those are kind of things that unless we get that into young people's head, they are going to be doing horribly they're going to be doing worse compared to today because like you said ai with the uh, chat gbt and 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 whatnot they are going to take over most of the current traditional jobs as we know them but if young kids learn about hobbies and so on they would find things in this world that ai cannot solve because they talk about creativity and i said doesn't matter how smart, even if AI is going to be a thousand times smarter, uh, a million times smarter than human being, one thing we are still better than them, and that is we are human. We feel pain. Computers don't feel pain. They we don't have mistakes. that. Sympathy. We make mistakes. We make mistakes. We feel pain. And we know what it feels like when your wife gives birth to a baby coming out full of blood and yuck and all that stuff all the messy stuff, they don't understand, right? So unless unless it is something from my heart, talking to another person with a heart, a beating heart, that is, uh, all bets are off. Uh, I, I don't care how how, how good the, 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 the software is. I much rather go to a restaurant where I'm being served and I can interact with other people. If it is a restaurant with just me and everything else is just machine, my God, that that is the lowest form of hell, as Dante put it. Mm -hmm. Dante was saying that the lowest level of hell, well, it's not level, it's actually the core, different, different, different uh, level. The lowest, the inner core of hell is not fire, it's ice, it's isolation, is alienation. That is the worst hell. And we're seeing that all around the world. And, and so we, so one, one of uh, our, our uh, uh, partners in, in contributing articles to World of Lead Index, uh, psychology professors, he was saying that we need to design work in the future so that we don't further alienate people. We don't further isolate people. It's not about cost. It's probably going to be not as effective if you have chat GPT talking to somebody and providing answers and so on. But people don't necessarily need or want that. They may want to talk to a person, like you said, who would make mistakes. Oh, hey, you know, I'm talk, I'm I'm giving you this advice, but maybe I'm wrong. You know, I, I'm only looking from my point of view. 
but those are kind of things that I think human being treasure. It's, it's what is the opinion of another human being, not something that is super smart and so on. So, I mean, if, if the world would succeed because our leaders are having IQ of 160, we would have no problem already. But because humanity doesn't work on just IQ of intellect, just having good IQ and knowing about uh, differential equations and uh, general relativity does not solve humanity's problem. So we need humans to solve human problem at the end. True. Affection. Affection. Um, and uh, actually, one of the treasures we misuse or we don't use at all is the ability of communication. We hardly communicate. We pretend to be communicating. Uh, we believe we may assume that we are communicating, but most of the time, people are in a rush. Take families, including uh, primarily families, within families. I mean, uh, sitting quietly and just talking, sh sharing interesting anecdotes, listening, without judging, without accusing. Criticizing and accusing are different things. Unfortunately, they are mixed usually. And personally, I prefer to criticize myself and try to understand myself and everybody else. And so for me, uh, I, I refrain from criticizing anyone. Or if I do, if I evaluate, evaluation is something else. We can't help evaluating. We need it. It's good. But then most of the time, we judge and condemn people wrongly. We criticize governments for the misdeeds of the judiciary system because we may say, oh, but you didn't allow the uh, accused, uh, the defendant to, you know, to be defended properly. But okay, but in our minds, we keep accusing people and without their knowledge, we usually exterminate them in our minds. We expel them from our vision, from our thought world. These are also, this is also a kind of capital punishment when you cut somebody off in your mind. Where is the justice in that? So uh, uh, the enjoy the joy of philosophy doing philosophy uh, living uh, these joys are free actually we have the words most of them and why not enjoy juggling with words which is literature actually uh, and then look at the possibilities and uh, you know and these make you happier uh, and we should uh, in families and uh, in schools I think more time should be given to uh, communication the art of communication the art of living um, so we sh we need to become artists in terms of living and we are not um, so um there is a lot to do, and thanks to AI, we can uh, afford to spare time. Mm -hmm. Because unless we become fruitful, we can increase crime rates. Uh, so AI gives us an opportunity, but it's like a knife. You can kill a person or you can use a knife to take out, out a bullet from a wounded person mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so we need more we need for more affectionate philosophy in dialogue in conversation that's why uh, i also call this series of interviews earth civilization dialogues uh, because earth civilization 
has already begun, whether we call it or not. But there are millions, even billions of people who actually agree with us when you ask them the main questions, mm -hmm. they are religious or not. So, uh, but we need a few more common words uh, uh, that may help us uh, function better. And uh, it is so sad to see miserable parents and children uh, just because of miscommunication. Most of the problems come from, I think, miscommunication. And uh, yeah. so the civility index is all also related to all these, I guess. You know, the, uh, that's what that's what is intended. Um, uh, some some economists um, that that I got a, a fortune to talk to. Um, one of them one time mentioned to me, Patrick, you know, this is a good thing, you know. Um, Economist has been talking about having a different measurement compared to GDP. Mm. And GDP, the war going on now in Ukraine actually increased GDP because there are more weapons being produced, more wage being paid, and so on. Mm -hmm. So just by having GDP increasing doesn't mean that the well-being of human beings are better off or for the planet. So, so GDP was useful uh, in the industrial age in terms of producing widgets from a factory, but in the 21st century, we need something else. And they were saying that, well, Patrick, you should really work hard because something like the World Civility Index could indicate how do you measure humanity in a, in a, in a better way. So as, as I speak, there are mathematicians and economists working on a formula how we can calculate the world civility index on a per country basis. So which country has the best um, index in, in that regard? So it's kind of similar to the world happiness index. Mm. Uh, and and there, are, there are quite a few other ones, uh, Gini uh, coefficient and, and so on. So, um, but there's nothing that measure uh, soft skills or empathy um, like the World of Lead Index. So, so they're saying that while well, World of Lead Index is, is, is a good measurement about empathy, those are kind of things that has not been measured yet. They measure, uh, well, how, how, how many people are uh, in a country, had gone to universities, gone to high school, and so on. So those are still fairly uh, industrial age kind of measurement because in, in regular schools, uh, they don't talk about etiquette. They don't talk about empathy. They talk about calculus, math, chemistries, and so on. So they talk about the hard skill while they don't really talk or teach about the soft skills. And so the Wills of Lady Index, since it's measuring about soft skills, is another indicator they can use uh, to promote something like this. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yes. And um, all words uh, are contextual. Is that the right word? I mean, it depends on the context. Even the word empathy. For example, once I try to empathize with um, someone doing a terrible thing because of faith, you know, because of believing that this God wants me to do this and doing that uh, crime, uh, killing somebody. Mm -hmm. I wanted to become that man in my mind and write a poem. I mean, what what is the mentality? What is the feeling of doing something like that? And I did write. Uh, I it's in English. Uh, I I don't know if I'll ever publish it or ever if I'll ever include it in any of my books because um, too much empathy. I mean, I, an ethical side of me refuses to be empathical. Yeah, you know, to show empathy in that case. You know, I refuse. Uh, I should maybe refuse. I. 
you know, although I, I don't like limitation in my imagination, whatever, still ethically there, I, I, I sense that uh, even the empathy should have a decent limit. You know, very interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So all words are uh, conditional. It depends on con condition. And um, re regarding intercultural communication in Bosnia, uh, Herzegovina, more than 10 years ago, I was invited to do a creative writing workshop to high school students. And in front of me, there were three groups of high school students from different schools, a group of Croatians, a group of uh, Bosnians, and a group of Serbs. Um, they were all young children when the tragedy occurred in Bosnia. But they have, were brought up, being brought up in that uh, social cultural milieu of bitterness. And how should I start my uh, presentation? So I said, some apples say down with bananas and oranges there should only be apples in the world these are <laughs> racist apples some apples say okay i'm an apple but let there be bananas and oranges too these are democratic democrats these are democratic apples and some apples say i did not choose to become an apple i want to become a fruit salad I said, I've been trying to become a fruit salad. <laughs> <laughs> wow. and, I, and I'm not Chinese enough or Armenian or Kurdish enough. And it's a lifelong journey, but the tendency, that's one of the things. And, uh, I, and I enjoy sharing this. And another thing is, what are some of the very simple that costs nothing that can help intercultural understanding. Okay, here's an idea. Choosing names. For example, I have chosen a Kurdish name, an Armenian name, uh, a Greek name, uh, a, a Jewish name, etc. for myself. I have 19 names. Uh, I don't use them in daily life, but I have chosen them and uh, Tarek is already Arabic. My last name is uh, Turkish, okay? So, because this is an ethical and simple idea. If everybody in the world can choose, wishes to choose names from cultures that have nasty experience in the past, you know, conflicts, full of conflicts, then we can start looking from the other side more easily. For example, I've been thinking about such things, you know, what are some of the simple, simple, simple things that can be immensely fruitful? Mm. And this one, for example, it's it costs nothing, it's free, it's simple, isn't it? Yeah, wow. I gotta I gotta write this down. Don't mind if I steal your idea. This is such a great idea. Thank you, but uh, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned this at a at a panel discussion in Istanbul, and a lady came. Uh, oh, there was this Lebanese, Armenian Lebanese social democrat politician. He stood up and said, I will choose. As an Armenian, I will choose a Turkish name and a Kurdish name for me. And then a lady came. I said, I'm married to an Armenian, but I never thought about choosing an Armenian name for myself. Hmm. You know, simple things are so easy that we can't think about them. That's why AI can help. We, why did 30,000 people manage to produce a Socrates, Plato, Aristoteles, Sophocles, so few people because there was slavery. Some people managed to live without working. Today's slaves will be AI. 
uh, and will give us. But if we don't use it fruitfully, as you've been working on, then the result may be terrible. Drugs, murder, mm -hmm. terrible lifestyles, etc. It's It's not automatically a good lifestyle. So mm -hmm. fruitfulness. And I think happiness is overrated. Why should happiness be a goal? Being proud of oneself, ethically, virtue should be a goal, I think. So we, and then once we can see it, uh, then we can also be happy. But trying to be happy should not be a goal. Trying to make happy may help you become happy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another thing. But if you try to be happy, you'll be miserable, I think. Forget about that. Try to do something mean, meaningful. Then you become happy anyway. Mm -hmm. And under any circumstances, no matter even in, you know, under even under extreme circumstances, you can still smile and say, well, this is part of the adventure. This is part of the game called life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. They were, I was, I was watching a documentary on on how Navy SEALs, the uh, the, the U.S. Uh, elite uh, soldiers, they were saying that under very extreme circumstances, you want to focus on the things you can control. Oh. Smile, like you said, smile, and just breathing. You know, I can control my breathing. I said, wow, that is so powerful. I never thought about something like this. Yes, 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 that's true. In the morning, one of the hundreds of phobias is the fear of not opening your eyes. I didn't know that until recently. So some people have this phobia. They are afraid of not being able to open their eyes in the morning. Isn't it interesting? So once you wake up and open your eyes, you have already won a victory. <laughs> and then getting up, you need courage to get up. Something in you life source, uh, life power, as uh, Bergson, I think, mentioned, something in you says, come on, live, and do something, inspire. And we need that. And that's why psychological warfare is important. That's why we should not be pessimistic. I think pessimism is unethical. I want to go as far as this. Shame on pessimists. Shame on you, pessimists. You have... If you are a pessimist, that means you don't have a serious problem to 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 sort to try to solve for. You're too comfortable to feel sad and deep. You're right. It's it's, it's <laughs> easy. It's it's so easy to be pessimistic because you don't have to do anything, right? Exactly. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <coughs> whereas whereas if you want to really really do something meaningful. Um, it's, it's, it's like I said, you know, people label me as a communist in, in, in a bad way and, and uh, communist. Well, in a good way, I think. I would, I consider myself a communist. My, many people who know me will be surprised because a commune in the, uh, uh, is, let's try to get rid of money in our lives. The more we humanize our relations, without any expectation of profit or anything, this solidarity, this is, uh, uh, I mean, if I were in North Korea, I would definitely be in the opposition or in countries like that. But uh, uh, Marx's uh, formula, Free individuals, the free association of free individuals, free thinking individuals. This is what I'm after. And Earth Civilization Network is such a network. It's a voluntary synergy group of uh, free thinking individuals. That's why I refrain from saying, let's do this or uh whatever i i prefer this i i would like to do this 
that's why I prefer saying I too am on this planet. I too am responsible. I say, I prefer to say I instead of we, not because I'm egotistic. I wish I were more. I'm not, unfortunately. Uh, but because uh, who am I to speak in, in, in the name of other people? Who am I to say we? I don't have the right to. Mm. I can speak only for myself. Mm. Uh, so if other another person, that's that's why uh, uh, speaking the first person singular may mean megalomania, but it may also may mean modesty. Uh, it depends on how you use it. Yeah, depends on the intention. Yes. Intention. Yes, yes. <laughs> it is very true. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it, it is. It is very true. Yeah. Um, I I never thought about it like like that. So, um, but I think you you're asking about my background and and my yeah. previous trainings and so on. It, it does have a lot to do with my instinct as to what I'm doing now with the World Civility Index Group, for example. And there are a lot of people uh, counting on us, looking up to us and say, like my trainers, they say, well, Patrick, you know, what can you do to help my training business do better and, and so on? So this is, this is really from a commercial point of view. Uh, and something in the recent history gave me a lot of hope in this world. Uh, I say, well, making money is not a dirty word. It's how you make the money and how you spend it. That's That could be problematic. Uh, now in the world, uh, there are a lot of people who are very rich and they want to do good to the, for the world. They have formed activist groups and they are demanding companies to also do good. Uh, something called the corporate social responsibility. Mm. That is what companies need to do good. Now, there are also something that evolved out of the corporate social responsibility, and that is called the ESG. And it stands for the environmental, social, and the governance. So ESG is a big thing now in the world. And I told, I talked to my two girls. I said, you know, daddy's so happy that uh, I have discovered there's something called ESG that has been going on for a number of years. And that is aligning business interests with doing good. So, so the two goes hand in hand. In other words, it's no longer just enough for a company to do well. And that is having the financial report, doing, you know, making money and so on. That, that has been the industrial model for the last two or 300 years. But now in, the, in, in this century, there's something called corporate social responsibility or ESG. And company has to write reports to show evidence that they're also doing good. So do well and do good. So they both have to be hand in hand before institutional investors, the, the big money will put money into into an ESG aligned company in that regard. So with that, uh, now there are a lot of criticism, like any good thing, you know, a lot of people say, oh yeah, ESG is just a scam, just marketing ploy and so on. Perhaps it is, but the spirit of it is still it's good. good. And, and so like everything else, you know, the devil is in the detail. It's depending on how the execution of, people if ESG and so on. So with the World Safety Index, for example, we are part of that S, the social impact part, you know, helping people to become more uh, empathetic, they, they feel safer at work, more respected, and so on. And we generate those uh, numbers. They, they can earn the World Safety Index points. And so the companies cannot do anything bad in terms of over exaggerating, embellishing, misrepresenting, or downright lying about, oh yeah, we're doing good and so on. No, no, no. They, they need to earn the world's stability index and, um, and we can show about it. So that eliminates a lot of the uh, uh, words 
that are against this uh, corporate social responsibility. They call them greenwashing. So we eliminating greenwashing. And so that's why that's why I'm so busy. We are so busy because companies are saying, hey, Patrick, you know, we want to use this World Civility Index for our employees and so on. So uh, we would not be labeled as greenwashing and, and so on. So, so by doing good, they are also going to be able to do well because investors will look at them profitably and say, wow, you know, doing good and doing well is all aligned. And sure enough, you know, you should be making more money because you're you're providing a lot of good things, measurable good things uh, to society. So I think I think those are the kind of things that um, that that we can do very much in 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 what you're doing. It's would there be possibility for you to uh, write articles, um, short videos, and they can distribute it inside a company so all the employees will be able to watch a five-minute video or watch, uh, read a five-minute article about your interpretation about your wisdom that can be shared with all these people right so those are the kind of things that i think i think i would love to be part of your group and following you in, yeah, in having something I'll like that yeah wonderful and uh how come um a torturer come comes home and live as a good father. This is possible. It has been done. This is compartmentalization. Uh, some sort of compartmentalization may be necessary, in you know, but flexible. But then, when it is total, it is schizophrenic and harmful. Your approach is holistic. And and this invitation, ESG, right? Uh, environmental social governance, mm -hmm. is it? Yeah. That is the uh, an outcome of a holistic approach to life. Life is multi all dimensional, multi dimensional. So, being an open entity, myself, but an open self, also with empathy, etc. And ethical, etc. Uh, that's why these are. Uh, so that's why Socrates is a very contemporary uh, philosopher because we again need to ask what is friendship, what is good. We need to ask these questions. I think every at every uh, new age, uh, people need to ask these questions. Uh, well. Um, what would you recommend to young earthmates or younger earthmates? Well, um, like in the IITTI youth standard, uh, they postulated the, the, the three pillars, the three essences. Uh, young people need to pick up hobbies, uh, maybe stamp collection, uh, rock collection, like my youngest girl uh, collecting rocks and all kinds of things, uh, basically opening their eyes. Second is, well, talk to your old man, like you and I, uh, more. Uh, talk to old people and so on. Uh, so we're recommending uh, whenever we can to, to governments saying that your school structure needs to allow young people to go out to the neighborhood and talk to the, the, the senior citizens in old folks' homes and, and whatnot. That would allow a lot of cross-generational uh, value exchange. And, and learn from that. Um, the third thing is they need to learn how to deal with boredom and other mental, spiritual issues. Those are kind of things that, unless they learn about something like this, uh, it's very hard for them to, to, to get to the other side. Thank you so much, dear Patrick Chan. And uh, by the way, elementary schools, pre-garden, um, kindergarten, high schools, universities, they should invite people, elderly people, to talk about their lives. What you said is very important, and this can be done. Thank you so much. Dear Earthmate, uh, we're together. Uh, that's I enjoy saying that at the uh, end. We're together. Thank you so much. We'll go on. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. My best wishes.